I have no idea what to do. So we got two more minutes. It looks like people are starting to jump in now. That participant count is jumping up pretty fast now. Yay! Woohoo! Nick, I showed one open question in the Q&A. But when I try to get into it with JAWS, it says there are none. Um, yep. There's none. OK. Yep. It's just the two from our initial. OK. Yeah, we're, we're set there. Just, just double checking. I love it when we are outnumbered as presenters. Makes it more fun. Absolutely. All right, I am gonna go ahead and jump right in here at the top of the hour. So welcome everybody to the second installation of our accessible PDF forms training presented by the Idaho Digital Accessibility Consortium and two of our major key stakeholders, Boise State University and the Idaho Assistive Technology Project housed up at the University of Idaho. Um, I am Lane Amaro. I happen to coordinate this crazy train. Welcome. Um, <laughs> Carolyn Quintero, Quintero from Boise State is our primary presenter today. So I don't wanna spend a, a whole lot of time um, I know she has a lot to cover, but you have Nick Stallings from the Idaho Assistive Tech Technology Project and myself as moderators today. Um, Sharina might join us. I'm not sure um, if she was she was going to jump in today or not, but if she does, she will be around as a moderator as well. Big shout out to Jessica and Carolyn, if you want to advance your, your slide for our welcome and housekeeping, I want to give a shout out to Jessica, our captioner today. Closed captioning is available if you are in, in need of that or want to access the, the captioning or the live transcript feature, you are welcome to. We absolutely encourage participation. So if you have questions, comments, um, please feel free if you can drop questions in the Q&A and comments in the chat, that helps us kind of stay organized on our side. But if you forget, that's fine too. If you want to speak, feel free to raise your hand. One of the moderators will try to, uh, to get you unmuted and kind of up here on stage with us to ask questions. And just be aware today, we are really going to focus on a shorter presentation and then opening the last 20 to 30 minutes of the session up for everyone to have an open mic to ask questions, to give things a try, um, ask for a, a second demonstration, whatever. Really, we, we want that to be um, it really open and available to you guys. So with that, I am just going to hush now and turn it over to Carolyn to talk to you guys about structuring your source document because 
Um, every accessible, a good accessible PDF starts with a good accessible source document. Thanks, Lane. So today for the agenda, like I said, we're going to try to aim for about 30 minutes. Um, and the agenda includes, we're going to do a very quick recap of what we learned in part one. Um, and then we'll have uh, what today's outcomes are. And the bulk of that is going to be how are we structuring our content in our documents. And that um, we'll talk also about some of those different design toolkit tools uh, that we have within Microsoft Word in particular to make the process a little smoother, uh, to tighten up your design a little bit so it's structured really well. Um, and then the last two steps for an accessible source document, always check accessibility and save as PDF. And then we'll have the workshop time for you guys to try it out. So as a review for this series, we are going with the scenario that we need to create a training needs survey for state employees. And really the desired outcome for this is to have three, a form that fits three different needs. We need to be able to print that form so it can be completed by someone using pen and paper. Um, and it needs to fit those print guidelines. So if it's printed out, it works for the, that uh, context. It also needs to be an electronic format. So someone can complete it using a computer or even a mobile device. And then it also has to have that necessary structure, that electronic structure to allow different types of assistive technology users to complete the form on a computer using their assistive technology. So that's kind of our goal for this series. And so that's what we're, uh, every single session, we're gonna take this a scenario a step further. And for some reason, the keyboard is not working for me, so I need to remember to use my mouse. So in part one, we talked about what is a training needs survey? What kind of questions do we need for a training needs survey? Um, what kind of content do we need for our questions? Um, what are those different con question considerations that we have? Remember, we talked about how do we provide, um, how do we get that specific information from people, that orienting information to draw them into the survey, and then those specific questions that we need. So those were kind of the three categories we talked about. And then also thinking about um, how to provide that content in a way that's manageable. So providing small bites of information. Remember, Sharina had the uh, analogy of don't feed someone with two forks. You don't just want one bite of information as you're thinking about your questions. So avoiding those really lengthy, if yes and or type questions. And then we also have to think about how we're formatting our answers because when you think about a print format, you can't have complex form fields like you do with an electronic form document. Pretty much you have text boxes and maybe some check boxes. Um, so you can't have a lot of those uh, combo boxes, drop down boxes and those kind of things on a PDF form, because even though it's electronic in one format, it needs to be printed as well. So we talked about some of those considerations. We also developed a list of questions and response types using our shared Google Doc. And if anyone needs to reference that, we have a link um, here. And then we also have one in the IDAC training site where we have our webinar recording from uh, the first uh, session. So that's our recap. We covered a lot of information. And today, we're really focusing on taking that information that we gathered in that first step and putting it into a document. So we need to organize that information with styles. Um, so if you're familiar with Microsoft Word, you might be familiar with styles. Um, if you're not, you will learn about them today. And then we also need to add our form responses to our document. So we have the questions, but we need to add any additional form responses to the document um, to help the user uh, go through the document and answer the question successfully. And then we need to adjust our design using um, the tools within Microsoft Word. And then finally, check accessibility, resolve any issues, and save as a PDF. So that's kind of our goal for today. And at the end of the presentation, we will have an accessible Microsoft Word document and a PDF document that is ready for our part three, where we actually start adding in those form fields in Adobe Acrobat Pro. So that's where we really start digging into Adobe. So this, uh, if you're very familiar with Microsoft Word, this might be a good review for you, um, but this really sets us up for part three. So when we talk about outlining and organizing our content using styles, you really have to think about how your document is structured. Um, when you think about a form, there are really four key areas for your form. You have a header area, you have an area where you have instructions, so you're telling users 
what are they going to do with this form? And then the bulk of your form is going to be that kind of that data collection piece. So that's where you're going to have your questions. You're going to have um, spaces for people to add their answers. Um, and then you have a footer information. So a footer uh, with information about your document as well. The header located at the beginning of the document, typically it's the head of the document. It includes uh, typically like a company logo with an alternative text description um, and a prominent form title. So this is where you're drawing people into the document that says, you know, this is who this document belongs to, the department, the agency, the business, whatever that is with that logo. And then the alternative text description describes that logo for um, anyone who is using an assistive a technology device like a screen reader. Um, and then the form title tells people what is this form about. So those are really good in the header area. This information doesn't need to repeat on every page. So typically on the first page at the very top, uh, at the very beginning, because it's also hidden by default in Microsoft Word. So you don't want to put a ton of really important content in the header. It's really just the snapshot of who does this form belong to and what's the title? And then when we save it as a PDF, we tag it um, appropriately. Our instructions are located after the header. Um, and this is where you really wanna keep your instructions fairly brief. And we have a whole nother section in this series about kind of packaging your form for delivery where we talk a little bit more about in-depth instructions. Here on the form, you wanna keep it fairly high level. Um, think about maybe providing information about who to contact for questions or support, or maybe if all of the questions are required, something about all questions are required unless otherwise noted. This is the high level instructions for your document. And then where you're gonna spend the majority of your time is this data collection area. It's located after the instructions. It's kind of logically where it falls next. You're gonna spend the most time designing and um, kind of editing this section of your form. And you want to organize it into sections, especially if you're talking about a form that has a lot of questions. And in this scenario, we have a needs assessment survey. So we've identified some kind of some different sections of questions. We talked about identifying questions, orienting questions, specific questions. And then also remember where signatures need to go. Typically, signatures go kind of at the end of a section if you're collecting information and needs to sign that particular section or at the end of the document. So you also have to be aware of where you're collecting signatures. And then the footer, like the header, it's also hidden by default. So you don't wanna put a ton of really important contact here, but it is located at the end of the document. If your form has more than one page, page counts are really helpful in this because that, especially if you're printing, um, those page counts can kind of help people keep the pages together. Um, and really any other optional kind of important information, um, like maybe contact information again, just to repeat it. Um, but again, it is hidden by default. So anything that you put down here needs to be tagged in the PDF document. And one thing to keep in mind is if you are using um, a similar um, kind of structure for all your forms, consider saving an organizational template. That way you can reuse this kind of format and then just fill it in as you go. And we did provide some links in the Canvas site on how to save um, content as a template. So keep that in mind as you're kind of developing forms for your department. Um, is this something you can reuse and make a reusable resource for uh, future forms? So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind as you go. So that's our form structure. Now we want to talk about kind of the design tools. So there's four kind of design elements. I'm, I'm definitely not a graphic designer, um, but these are four um, concepts that really help me when I'm talking about information design. The idea of contrast is making things look different. So when you're thinking about a document or a form, um, using different fonts and sizes for your heading sections or your titles versus, you know, your your question text um, that can really help people zoom in on those different sections, um, having that different contrasting fonts, um, fonts and sizes. Sometimes you want to use color, but again, we're thinking about a print document. Um, so you want to make it very good for uh, printing in grayscale. So you want to use color sparingly. 
um, and make sure there's enough contrast so that if it is printed in black and white, it still shows up. When we talk about repetition. Carolyn? Yes. Real quick, we just had a question come through. Um, yes. What do you mean when something is hidden by default? So when it is hidden by default, I will demonstrate that at the end when we save as PDF. Those are tags that Microsoft Office kind of hides from the save as PDF process. So it doesn't always show up like in the reading order of the document, if that makes sense. Does that help? That was in our Q&A, so I, I went ahead and said we answered it live. We'll wait and see if we have any more questions. Perfect. So, and I will show that uh, when we save as PDF in the demonstration. So, great question. So, when we talk about repetition, um, that's really just repeating um, elements throughout your document in a consistent way. So, if you are using a certain heading style, use that throughout your document. If you are using certain bullet style or list style, you're using those same repeating elements throughout the document. And we do that by using some of the word outline view tools and style tools. And with our contrast, we also use those style tools to help with that. When we talk about alignment, we want to make sure that everything on the page is connected to each other. So if we're using spacing, it's consistent, it's all aligned really well. Um, and we do that with using tab stops. Um, we can use the rulers and grid lines to help us make sure we have consistent alignment. Um, we can use the spacing tool to make sure we have consistent alignment and spacing in our document. And then again, that styles tool really helps with this. And then the idea of proximity is if things are connected, grouping them a little closer together. So is your heading text close to your paragraph text? And are those different sections, or is there a little bit more spacing between them? So um, tweaking these a little bit as you go can really make a, 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 a difference in the design of your document and make it more readable for users and make it easier to navigate. So I'll hey, demonstrate. Carolyn? Yes. I'm sorry. Just going back to we had two questions now, one comment and one question. Um, okay. Can you speak to a little bit more about color and contrast? Um, one yes. individual, uh, she said that she thought color was not good to use for accessibility, which is a good a misconception, I think. Yeah. Um, and then we had another one that said when using colors, even with contrast, shouldn't you be cautious about the colors for those who may not who may have color issues? Absolutely. So that's why I say sometimes color. Um, there are tools you can use to make sure you have enough contrast between color. Um, but when you're talking about a document or something that's going to be printed like this, really use color sparingly. And it can be used um, to provide some really good contrast. Like Boise State is blue and orange. We're known for blue and orange. So if I use a color in a heading to create some contrast, maybe I use my blue because it has a better contrast ratio and shows up a little better if it's printed in black and white than the orange because our orange is a little bit different it's harder for some colors to see if you have different types of color um, blindness the orange is really tricky so i use that much more sparingly um, the main place when i'm thinking about like print forms that i would use color if you have color in your logo make that your splash of color, but then mainly stick with those um, kind of uh, black, dark gray type of contrasts. And there are tools you can use, and we can add a link um, to a couple of them in the IDEC training site if you want to verify if you are using a color, does it meet that contrast requirement? Does that help? Carolyn, this is Lane. I'm yes. going to jump in, <laughs> jump, jumping in from the, um, you know, kind of web accessibility and um, universal design background that I have, you can use color anywhere, any way you want. Um, just being aware that some people may not be able to see the color. So also having a text alternative. The most common mm -hmm. example I give is people say, anything in red is required. Yes. Well, anything in red with an asterisk is required because then you have the asterisk, that text character that says this is required, and then you also have the color. Um, if it's an error form, you know, in the interactive forms that which is way beyond what we're talking about here. Yeah. <laughs> but you can use color that is that is totally okay, even encouraged as long as again is focusing on that contrast ratio between the background, uh, foreground and backgrounds, 
and then always making sure you have some other way to convey the meaning. So click the green Absolutely. button in the top right, not good, but you know, click the green submit button. Okay, you know, like that text. So um, way beyond what we're, we're dealing with today, but I yeah. hope that between the two of us, we fully answered the color question. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that, Lane, because I'm thinking mainly in the context of this scenario, um, you do want to use color a little more limited unless you do have those good identifiers. Like um, you probably don't want to put like all red fields are required because if again if we're thinking about those print considerations here that's not going to work well but if you're doing things online color is a great way to add contrast so that's again one of those design concepts um we have blue and orange all over our boise state website that is part of our brand that helps communicate to inform um, information in a way um that you know no color would but we have those good contrast ratios so that even if you have those different types of uh, color deficiency you can still read the content you can still access the information so excellent question about color and we can we could have a whole session just about color so uh were there any other questions before i move along no i think that that definitely okay. covers both of them so far so. awesome great questions thank you um so after we've structured our document, we've designed it, we're happy with the way it looks. Now we need to check accessibility. And this is totally a, a preference. I tend to check accessibility at the end of my document. I use it as kind of a step at the end of my process. You can check accessibility anytime throughout your process. There even is a new option in um, Microsoft Word in the newest version of Microsoft Word to always have the accessibility checker running. So you can check accessibility at any step in the process. But one thing you should always do before you uh, save your PDF, always do a final check accessibility to see if there are any errors that you might have missed. I don't always add alternative text to my images right when I add them to my document because in my workflow process, I add that at the end. So it just, is totally up to you, but always before you do that final save, check accessibility. And if you've never used the check accessibility tool, you go to file, info, check for issues, check accessibility. And we'll demonstrate that here in just a minute. And then when you're saving as a PDF, once you've made sure your document is accessible, it checks all the boxes on the accessibility checker in Word, there are two ways to save as PDF. There is a good way, and there is a bad way. So the good way is to save as PDF. And there's a couple different ways to do that. I have an Adobe plugin in my Microsoft Word. So I have a quick shortcut to save as Adobe PDF. Or if you don't have that, it, you go file, save as, so choose your save as type and select PDF. That retains all of the work you've done to make an accessible source document. If you print as PDF, you'll have a well-designed PDF. You won't have an accessible one because it strips out all those tags that you've taken the time to use um, to add into your document using the style tags. And I'll demonstrate that in a little bit. So we're almost at the 30 minute mark. I want to do a quick demo of what this looks like. And I will go fairly fast, but we'll have an additional amount of time to ask any questions and i've made how to uh, videos to walk through this entire process step by step so if you do feel overwhelmed of maybe you missed something we have videos that cover all of these steps and we have them um, we have the playlist available as a link um, to the youtube videos directly or they're all linked in the idac site so keep in mind We've, we've got additional resources for you guys to work on this. So let me switch over to my Word document. All right, everyone got the Word document up on the page? Perfect. So here I've taken uh, our questions from our original source document, the one we worked on last um, week plugged all our questions into our Microsoft Word document, and I've started kind of structuring it. So I have our IDAC, Idaho Digital Accessibility Consortium logo in the header. 
and I have a title, Needs Assessment Survey for State Employees. I've also plugged in some survey instructions. So please complete this IDAC survey to help direct future trainings and offerings about accessibility. For questions or support, please contact, and then some contact information. If it was appropriate to, um, like if there's specific questions that are required, maybe I put something here about the types of questions that are required. I tend to assume every question is required when I'm filling it out unless it's otherwise specified. So again, if that's important for your form, add that kind of information in for the instructions. And then you also have to think about, so this is our high level instructions. Remember, this is kind of the over our overarching um, like 10,000 foot view of what are the instructions for this form. You know, what's the purpose of the form and who do I contact for help? But then you also have to think of, are there any instructions I need to include for specific questions? So if you have date, if you need that date entered in a certain way, include that information here. You know, you want this as month, day, year. If it doesn't matter, leave it date and I'll probably fill it out however I feel comfortable filling it out. Same with name. If you need to have name in a specific format, for example, first name, middle name, last name, put that information on the form, like in parentheses or something to notify people how they're going to enter that data. If it doesn't matter, again, leave it open to name. People will fill it out how they want. Uh, where was the other one we talked about? For example, for this one, we had a list of multiple choice options. So what tools are available for your agency to make documents? We came up with a list of like four things, and then we wanted to have an other text box. So if someone checked other, we want to have them fill out what in um, fill out some information. So I had to include a little bit of text that says, please specify what other tools are available. And then we had another question that was, do you know what tools you need to create accessible uh, documents or web content? And we wanted that to be a yes, no, I don't know, or I'm unsure. So anything I need to add to kind of make those check boxes work, I need to add in here. When we talked about our scale, um, what is your comfort level with technology? We wanted to have a scale, we identified that. But we also need to provide information to the user to let them know, again, this is a checkbox. We can't make it a radio box where we force them to just choose one option. So we have to put that instruction on the page. Please select the option that best describes you. And then we also have to define what that scale is. So we can't just say one, two, three, four, five, because what if I think one is really advanced and five is not, and other persons think the reverse? We have to define what that scale is for users so that they know when they select number three, it means this. So we put in some selection here to define that scale. So it's really easy for users to choose, you know, the one that best fits them. And then if you have any examples that you need to include, um, for example, in our very last question here, what accessibility trainings would you potentially attend if held by your institution? In parentheses, for example, Microsoft, visual presentations, video conferencing, et cetera. So once you have your questions on there, think about if you need to provide a specific set of instructions for that question, provide it in parentheses or close to the question so that users know, okay, this is what I need to add there. So that's what we talk about when we think about instructions. Then our next step was to outline our content. I like using the outline tool in Microsoft Word. So we go to view and then outline under the views tab or the views section. And I really like this one because if you're new to kind of nesting headings, this gives a really good kind of visual of how those different sections are connected to each other. And when you're um, kind of going back to uh, the web content accessibility standards, typically you need to have one heading one on a um, on a web page. So I tend to follow that on um, shorter documents. I try to aim for one heading one. In this instance, I want my survey instructions to be my level one heading. And then I've got this identifying information, orienting information and specific information. Those are my three main sections. So I can choose those to be my level two, 
headings. Where's my other one? Orienting information and specific information. But those, those, so those are my sections, but they don't really um, tell the user a lot of information. So maybe I need to change the text. Let's say uh, identifying information is now about you. We've got orienting information. Um, that's not super helpful. So you can kind of scan your questions to see, well, what is in this section? And I see a question about tools and I see another question about tools. So maybe these two questions can be their own section about tools. And then I also see a job dedication. So what percentage of your job is dedicated to document creation? So maybe that's responsibility. And then that can be like my level three. And then I've got a couple questions about like comfort and skill level. So I'm going to say these are skills. And that can be my level three. And then this orienting information, since I have a section about tools, responsibility and skills, maybe this gets changed to tools, responsibilities and skills. And what that does is that communicates to the user, what are they going to find in this section? So that's really helpful if you have um, a lot of information. You could also make tools its own level two, responsibility its own level two, and skills its own level two. I just wanted to demonstrate kind of how these different sections can work together. And then the specific information, these questions are kind of asking about challenges and training. So there we can kind of get a view of how our content is connected to uh, together. And then when we close the outline view, all of a sudden we've got a little bit more design to our document. So we have some contrast with our different heading styles. And if we look at our content, it is now the survey instructions is now tagged as heading one. About you is tagged as heading two and tools is tagged as heading three. So we're starting to add that electronic structure that we need to make that document accessible. So the thing you need to remember about making an accessible source document for forms for starting with Microsoft Word, when you are done with this Microsoft Word document, it will not look like a form. Anything you do to try to make this document look like a form, like drawing lines or um, using a table or anything like that, anything you do to make it look like a form is going to make it more difficult to make it a form in PDF, in the Adobe PDF tool. So what we want to do instead, we want to use all of the form tools in Adobe PDF or Adobe Acrobat. We want to draw the space, basically create the space in this source document so we can draw those form fields in later. And so we do that by playing around with our tab stops and our spacing and um, maybe using columns if it's appropriate. And I've used these styling tools to really help create shortcuts for that. So when you're thinking about short text fields, so date, name, what organization are you affiliated with, and what is your job title? We identified those four questions as needing a short text field. And we could just leave one line of text for all of these fields and then draw that form field in when we are in Adobe Acrobat. But date doesn't need to take up that much space. And name, we probably want a little bit more space, but it could be a little shorter than some of than just being on its own line. So if we want to put them on the same line, rather than you know creating space by hitting tab, 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 or using our space key, um, every time we do that, we add a character that gets tagged as a tag, like a paragraph tag in Adobe Acrobat Pro. And we don't really want that because that adds a lot of um, just extra stuff that you have to work through in Adobe. So a better way to do that is to use a tab stop. And I like using this ruler. You can kind of pick where on the page you want. So I'm going to put my mouse underneath the two inch mark and click for a tab stop. And now when I hit tab, I have one character space between those. So now when I draw my form field in in Adobe, 
I can draw a nice form field for date and I can draw a nice form field for name. And then what organization are you affiliated with? What is your job title? Those work. But again, if we want to reduce the space between these, we can play around with the paragraph spacing. So under paragraph, you can adjust spacing so that they're a little closer together. And I saved a style called short answer. It undid my tab stop, but I create I saved a um, style as short answer so I could reuse that style throughout my document if I have other areas with short answers. Because, for example, under the responsibility section, I've got short answer questions, so I can use that style and it kind of tightens that up for me. So those are our short edit questions. Then we have to think about um, multiple choice types questions. Well, actually, let's do the large edit questions. Um, because the large, if you need to have more space for people to answer questions, it's the same process. You just provide additional spacing. So our questions that needed kind of long, um, more text space after is this, what do you feel your current skill level is in creating accessible documents or web content? We wanted to give people more space to uh, type in maybe a sentence or two. So again, I can change my paragraph spacing to have some additional space. And I can save that as a large text field. So that way, if I need to add that spacing in in the future, I can. So again, that just makes it pretty quick. So I'm using a similar style throughout my entire document. And then so that takes care of, you know, our small text fields and our large text fields. And then the last one, the check boxes. So with check boxes, we kind of need to leave space um, before our answer for our checkbox to go. So what tools are available at your agency to make accessible documents? I need to add an instruction. Please select all that apply. Because this is a checkbox, people can pick more than one. And again, I want to use a tab stop. So I'm going to move things over to about the whatever that mark is. I'm drawing a blank on how just before the half inch for a tab stop. And then I can jump all my content, all my content over. And that's going to give us enough space. Um, I think the default checkbooks checkbox size is about a quarter inch by a quarter inch. So that's a decent size checkbox. So that gives us enough space. But then we also have this other, we want a text box there. So how do we handle that? We could add space after, but we've got all this white space on the other side of our page. So this is a good place to use columns. So we can go to layout, highlight our text, go to layout, and there's different types of preformatted columns. Since we want to have um, we don't really need equal sized columns. We kind of want to have this staggered alignment so we have enough room for that text box. So I'm going to choose this um, left column alignment. And now I've got two columns with more space on the right. But I only want this other one because I want to have a good, decent sized text box underneath here. So I'm going to, under layout, I'm going to add a column break there. So now I've got my check boxes all lined up. I've got my other and I've got space in front of it. And then I can draw a text box underneath it as well. And I can also save kind of those tab stops as a style so I can apply it in other places. And then when you have uh, not as many options, so like, yes, no, I don't know, you could use the space going across the page because that's a fairly, uh, there's not a ton of options, so users aren't going to get lost as they're kind of reading across the page versus reading a list up and down. So our list up above had five options. We want to use that, that vertical space. But if you only have two or three options, it's good to use that horizontal space. So again, I can use those tab stops. So I created one for my multiple choice list. So that kind of jumps it over for me, and it's all lined up nice. But if I want them all on the same page, then I can use that multiple choice tab stop list and they're all spaced nice and evenly. And then my scale, again, it's just a multiple choice text box. And um, 
since I have that created as a style, I can select that and now everything is all lined up nicely. So that is a very quick review. And then um, for our footer, once we're on our footer, you can just insert like page numbers. Like I said, page numbers are pretty, um, pretty good, especially if you have more than one page number. You don't want to put a ton of information down here because uh, that's just more you have to do in Adobe PDF. And, you know, this is really kind of just, a, you know, that extra information um, for the page. So now we've structured our document. We've got headings, we've got spacing, we are almost there. And then we can edit our header and tag it with a title. When you're thinking about images, um, the default when you add an image to Microsoft Word is always in line with text. And that is really important if you are sharing Word documents. If you are not sharing it, this is a Word document, if you're sharing it as a PDF, you can do text wrapping because in Adobe, we can tag the image in a way that um, assistive technology users can find the image. If it's not in line with text, um, it, think about it as here's the image, here's it, here's it in line with the text. When you text wrap it, it hides it behind the text. So we don't want to do that with Microsoft Word, but since we're saving it as Adobe PDF, we can tag that and bring that to the forefront so that uh, we can make that alternative text description visible. So we'll show what that looks like. So our document is looking pretty good. It's all aligned. We've got good heading. We've got good contrast. Um, if we wanted to change our style at any time, we could now using those different styles, using those different design tools in Adobe. But now when we're ready to save it, we need to do an accessibility check. So file, info, check for issues, check accessibility. And here, I just described that um, image not in line. If you are saving as a PDF again, this is an error you can ignore in Microsoft Word. If you are sharing this as a Word document, they do need to be in line. So um, that's one that I, I wish there was a way to differentiate that in Microsoft Word, but there's not. So we know that the only error here is image or object not in line. If we wanted to fix it, there's a little drop down arrow that kind of tells us we can mark something as decorative. We can place it in line. And then if you have any other questions, there's information down below about why you should fix this and steps to fix. So any errors that pop up in that accessibility report, um, you can kind of troubleshoot and review. But then we want to save as Adobe PDF. So like I said, I have this Adobe plugin that I've added to my Word. So I have this shortcut, save as Adobe PDF. If I didn't have this here, I could do file, save as, and I need to find a place to save this. I'll just save it on my document or on my desktop. I'm going to go file, save as, save as type PDF, and then hit save. So is my screen sharing the PDF document now? Or is it still on the Word document? Still on Word. All right, let me pull up. How about now? Good to go. Awesome. So. Here's our PDF document. It looks exactly the same as our Word document. It's really nice, um, nicely formatted. It's ready for us in PDF. But here's the big payoff for putting that time in to make your source document accessible. When we look at the PDF tags, they are all there. So our heading one is tagged as a heading one. Our paragraph text, our links, um, our heading twos, those are all there. But you notice, that let me pull up my reading order tool nothing in the header is tagged and nothing in the footer is tagged that's what i mean by microsoft word hides that content by default when it saves as a pdf so those are the only two pieces that we'll have to like manually tag as content using our tagging tool and i'll show with that's where we'll pick up in the next series. And just to demonstrate the difference, I am going to share my Word document, and I'm going to print as PDF. 
I've got Microsoft print to PDF selected and I'm going to print this. And then just gonna save this as a test document on my desktop. And now when I open this document, I'll get it open really quick. So this is my print as PDF. Let's look at the tags, no tags. So we don't wanna print as PDF because all that wonderful work that you did to make your document accessible isn't, doesn't come over to Adobe PDF. So that's, the, that's why we say it's the bad way to save as PDF. So I went a little over, but we still have 15 minutes for questions and all of that good stuff. So I know it was super fast, but we do have videos on how I did all of that and how you can work on it too. All right, Carolyn, I just put the link to the YouTube series. So for Perfect. anybody who is not signed and does not um, have a Canvas account is not doing the, the self paced and recordings and, and that kind of thing. Um, they are on that YouTube link. Um, so you can follow along. They're broken down into smaller bite sized pieces. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was a challenge. Accessible Microsoft Word doc in 30 minutes. I got in it 45. So, <laughs> yes. but that, that, um, that process, uh, if we don't have any questions, I'll kind of jump back over to uh, the presentation again. And then if anyone has questions, feel free to um, pop them in. All right, do we got the presentation back up? I am seeing a couple of, of questions pop up in the Q&A. Okay. I just didn't get to them quick enough with the screen reader. Perfect. So our first one, it says, will you be doing an informal session about how to save styles? It sounds like that they, might be a topic for Yeah, well, one. and those are all in the step-by-step -step question or step-by-step -step videos of how to kind of set up those different styles. But next week, when we have kind of the drop-in session, that's something we can totally go over as well. Um, so check out the how to's see if that kind of answers your questions for saving the styles and then if it doesn't join us next next Thursday same time and we can kind of go through it again. Um, and if I need to, we can totally find resources on how to do that, or I can do a step by step video on how to do it as well. Perfect. Okay, yeah. number two is, um, would you set up an agenda in a similar format i'm not sure exactly what that was referring to. So the nice thing about all those tips is you can use them for any document. When it comes to a form, um, that's when you're going to use those line and spacing tools a little bit more and those tab stops. But if you have an agenda and you want to set it up so that there's those similar styles throughout, definitely use those. Um, you just won't maybe need to cr create as much um, space but again if you want to create a kind of an agenda form that maybe you type minutes into maybe you use those columns and tabs so you leave that space and then you can create a kind of a pdf template um, that's an accessible form that you can reuse for different meetings so yeah you can use these skills for any type of document you're working on those heading styles are fantastic um, whether it's just uh, whether it's a form whether it's an agenda for a meeting um, whether it's kind of an information flyer that those style tags are what are going to give your PDF document that accessible structure to start with. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you. And then we just got one more chat. Uh, yeah. This is going, I, I like this question, Jeremy. This is perfect. I'll, I'll let Carolyn take it. But um, Jeremy says it seems like PDF should only be used when the intended document is meant to be printed, which I would argue against that. Can you think <laughs> of any other reasons why someone would want to go through the pain of making a PDF accessible? So, and Jeremy, you're correct. The pain. It's not it, easy, unfortunately. It is. Um, and that kind of sets up my, my next step. I love documents. So um, I think they are fantastic for drafting, for collaborating, for um, outlining your information, and they're a fantastic tool. Where the problem is, is when they are the only way 
that information is being shared. So if you're sharing this in an email, you know, providing some of the context in the email as well, rather than here's my email, here's the attachment, and you have to open the attachment to get the information. Or if you're sharing it on a website, you know, here's our web page, here's the document, no other context for users to get information. Um, if you have all that information in a PDF, you can translate that into a web page, into a video transcript, into you know whatever different format your content needs to be in. But you don't want to kind of lock your content just in a PDF. So I use it as one of my tools in my toolkit, and I love I love documents. So I usually start in a document, get all my information outlined. But then if I'm sharing it on a web, I also put it on a website, or if I'm sharing it on social media, I can now link that web page that has the accessible PDF and all the information on it. So it really just depends on what the information is, um, how is it being shared, and you know, kind of what's the purpose. Um, so it's, it's one of your tools in your toolkit. It uh, shouldn't be the only, it, the only way you're sharing information, because there are some things that are better in a PDF format if it's used in conjunction with some other ways to share information, if that makes sense. Does that answer the question? I'm not sure. Yes, it does. Actually, okay. that's perfect. Okay. I was going to say, I'm not sure if that does. We have a couple other questions, yep, but yes. A couple of other okay. questions. So, Carolyn, um, Nick, so, before we jump into those real quick, Carolyn, are we finished with the PowerPoint? Do you want to, to drop that so that uh, people get to see us? Yeah, let me finish up this last little bit um, and then we'll switch over. So just to kind of re reiterate the form design process, first organize your information, add in any of those form responses that you need to have. So any questions that need instructions or specific um, information that you need to collect from users. If you have scales, you know, what, how do you define those scales, add those form responses in and then use those design tools, those tab stops, those columns, those um, line spacing tools to kind of fine tune your design. And then always check for accessibility and save as PDF. So that's kind of the, and again, this workflow can be done in any, any way. You can check accessibility every time you add something to your document. Um, you can change up your design as you're adding those responses, but always check accessibility one last time before you save as PDF, never print as PDF. Um, and then one last thing, this was kind of a review that you can use when we're working on our document, but the main thing for this is understanding an accessible document workflow like the one we're covering in this series can really help you troubleshoot issues um, in an existing inaccessible document. So, and again, I have the picture of the antelopes running away here because if you know how to make the document accessible from the source document, you can kind of troubleshoot, should I continue to fight with Adobe on some of these errors that are popping up that I don't understand? Or should I just leave this PDF and start over, copy and paste into an accessible source document? I have spent five months of my life working on a very complex document, um, and I ultimately just had to abandon it and start over from scratch, and it saved me so much time. So even though you feel like, ah, oh, crud, I don't want to redo this and start all over, sometimes when it comes to access, um, inaccessible PDFs, it is the better way just to abandon the one that's been saved multiple times, been redesigned by who, who knows how long, um, how old it is. Copy and paste it into a uh, clean Microsoft Word document, follow that workflow, and it's going to save beautifully for you and just be so much less of a headache. So that's kind of my, my spiel for the presentation. And then all we have left is just we have all these resources available in the Canvas site. I'll be here next week um, if you have any individual questions. Um, and then if you feel like sticking around for the next few minutes and playing around in the document, we'll share uh, the source document I was working on. And you guys can kind of follow the format on your own. And there, Caroline, I'm all done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all right, we'll go back through here real yes. quick. Uh, Katrina, um, she's just curious about opening tags, um, how to get the tags menu. And Katrina, you want to make sure you're going to be using a, a Adobe Acrobat Pro for that. Yes. Um, that's going to be the catch, but it's just on the left-hand side. You should see a small carrot arrow. 
Um, uh, Carolyn, do you have to be in accessibility for that? I don't think you do. No, nope. I don't think so. Always I don't be think there. So, um, however, sometimes when you click that little carrot, if you move your mouse over to the left side of Adobe Acrobat Pro and the little carrot does not pop up over there, um, you may have to click view mm -hmm. and then tools. It's view, and... show, hide, navigation pane. Okay. Yep. Yes. So if you don't have the tag navigation pane uh, selected by default, view, show, hide, navigation panes, and then you can select any and all navigation panes that you want. And then every time you open Adobe from then on, they should stay there. Yep. Perfect. Okay. And then we have another question regarding Google Forms. Are there accessible yes. accessibility options? Is that a whole nother thing? Um, just what happens in Google Forms? So that's electronic form. So it just depends on, um, it can be, and you can also make them inaccessible. So again, it just depends on the types of questions you're asking. You can use a lot of the same um, techniques that we've used uh, so far to describe this information as far as you know, providing um, small bites of information, gathering the information that you need, making sure your questions are well done. And then the more simple you can go on an electronic form even. So plain text, uh, large text, short text fields, um, anything that involves like dragging and dropping or has to include a mouse, stay away from those types of questions because there's, um, some of them are not always keyboard accessible um, and they can be very difficult for users. So again, when you're thinking forms, think simple. Um, if you're uh, having multiple choices, how are you defining those multiple choices? Um, and then there are different tools to check whether or not your form is, is uh, meeting accessibility requirements in the electronic format. So a lot of the same principles is just a little bit different um, testing process. Yeah. Okay. And our last yeah. one, we've got anonymous Tenny. Um, if we have a long set of instructions, information for the beginning of the document, like half a page or more, is that okay to include at the beginning of the form or for accessibility sake, should it be its own document? In other words, does a large block of text complicate the tags or accessibility? So, Yes and no. Um, I tend to leave those really lengthy instructions off of the document and just keep the form with the form. And the way I think about it is when someone is accessing that form, they can jump from field to field to field to field. They may never read any of the paragraph text on the page. So, and we'll talk about that more next time when we talk about tool tips and instructions. I tend to, if I'm sharing again, go back to kind of that hybrid method. I have my accessible form, but I'm sharing this information on a web page. Include that half a page of information on the web page. So that way you're providing those instructions before someone gets to the form. So we, again, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about that particular question. So keep that one in mind. But I, I tend to kind of do that hybrid method of, Here's my instructions. Here's everything you need to complete this form successfully. Now download and open and access the form. So um, you can also include it on the form, but it shouldn't be the only place that you're including it, if that helps. Because we have some forms that um, did include a lot of really lengthy instructions. Um, we put it on a web page so everyone knew exactly what they needed before the form. And then we also incorporated those instructions throughout the form as we went. So, I would almost say yeah. too that's we're getting into glitchiness as well. I'll exactly. figure the form is, which we haven't even started talking about. Yet. No, so uh, it it is there, uh, but you have to kind of put yourself in the in the um, in the shoes of the user. You know, are they even going to read that first page, or is there are they going to jump in and just start filling out the form field? So, what can you give them before they ever get to the form to help them be successful for it? But if you're thinking about like a print version, so I used to work in a registrar's office, all of our forms were printed out so students could grab them as go and go. That needed to be on the page because they didn't have access to a web page. So in those situations, have a print version that you're going to have 
outside your uh, office building and then have a web version that kind of uses that hybrid method of here's all the instructions now download the form so it's just different um different context of where the people are accessing the form that you kind of need to take into mind yep we will go over that more in the next couple sessions that this these are all questions that we're working on from here on out so i don't want anyone to think that I've got my accessible PDF. We're going to walk you through the whole process to delivering it to the to the end user and how we're getting to it. So that this is only part two. <laughs> we still have several more steps to go. Exactly. That's a huge yeah. topic. But Carolyn, that is everyone. That is awesome. everything. Jeremy Those great and questions. Jeremy and Lane, we're doing some communicating there. I won't worry about that. Everyone can read that if they'd like. But yeah, that's it for QA and any other chat questions. Awesome. Well, I hope I see you guys some um, next week. If you have any questions, check out the videos um, and get in touch with us if you have any other questions. Thank you, everyone. We're coming here. It's 158. We will lose our transcription here, our captioner at two o'clock on the dot, hard to stop. Um, so we'll just let this pass through here just in case anyone has any other questions, but I will close it down at two o'clock on the dot. Awesome. Thank you all. Yes, and we Thanks. can still open mic if anybody had wanted to, to yep. speak, share comments, questions, um, rather